what I'm talking about, or it can be anything related to stuff that I write, which will then cover the fiction part. So, space. Space sounds like the future. It's rocket ships and astronauts. It's Buck Rogers and Captain Kirk, the golden age of science fiction. But our ideas about the future are built on 1950s sexism. And it's not just our ideas, but the actual infrastructure of space travel, which leads us to a place where, in real life, a German woman has never been to space. Welcome to the 21st century. In 2007, Peggy Whitson, an American astronaut, launched as part of Expedition 16 on her second trip to the ISS. When the expedition 15 commander departed, Whitson became the first woman commander of the ISS. At the time, she was one of only three women to have lived on the ISS in the seven years of its, ex of its existence. Sunita Williams later commanded the station in 2012 on Expedition 33, and Whitson commanded again in 2017 on its Expedition, excuse me, in 2017 on Expedition 66. Last year, Samantha Christopher Reddy became the first European woman to command the ISS. So in the 20 year history of the ISS, only three women have commanded it. All of them are amazing, but why did it take so long to have a woman commander and why are there only three? So only 72 women have been into space. When 90% of the space travelers are men, it's easy for stretches of years to pass in which the ISS is populated by all male crews. The current record for number of women in space is four. 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 I... <clears throat> uh, that was set when the space shuttle Discovery visited the ISS in 2010. The Discovery had a balanced crew, and its three women joined Tracy Caldwell Dyson, who was the only woman in a crew of six on station. Nine men, four women in space. That same year marked the first time that two women served on the ISS simultaneously. When it happened, it seemed as if having multiple women in space was about to become a regular thing. Uh, it's been a decade since those four women flew together. It took another decade for two women to serve on the ISS at the same time. In 2019, Anne McLean and Christina Cook were supposed to do the first all-woman spacewalk that was famously rescheduled due to lacking two spacesuits that could fit women. <laughs> this is not science fiction. Uh, it happened to coincide with National Women's History Month in the United States, and it looked like a perfect PR opportunity. But it was an accident. The year prior, a Soyuz spacecraft had malfunctioned during launch, which shifted the staffing schedule on the International Space Station. In the original ISS schedule, Anne McLean and Christina Cook did not overlap. Let me just underline that again. Having two women in space at the same time was an accident. So how did we get there? There is a causal chain that begins with the design of the extra, mobi the extra vehicular mobility unit, or EMU, and leads through to present day staffing choices. The EMUs were designed more than 40 years ago at a time when all the astronauts were men. 11 of the original EM 18 EMUs are still in use, but only four are still rated for spaceflight. Actually, I think it's only three right now. Only three are still rated for spaceflight, and all of those are on the ISS. 
NASA used to have small, medium, large, and extra large spacesuits. For budget reasons, the small and extra large were cut. However, many of the male astronauts could not fit into the large suits, so the extra larges were brought back. The small suits never were. According to Katie Coleman, a shuttle-era astronaut, she had to improvise padding to wear inside the EMU when she was in the neutral buoyancy lab. So that's a giant swimming pool with a full-size mock-up of the ISS inside it. And many of the problems that she had in the NBL were what they call 1G effects, things that she would only experience on Earth, but the NBL is where they decide who gets to do a spacewalk. And complaints about a suit that doesn't fit? Well, no one else has had a problem, so it must just be the person who complained. In very practical terms, when an EMU is too big, it causes a number of problems. The hard upper torso, or hut, is a fiberglass shell. So to get the best range of movement, you need to wear the smallest hut possible, because if it's too big, that armhole is out here, and you literally cannot move your arm. If you're too small for your hut, you have problems reaching the dials on the front of the EMU, which means you can't do things like control your suit temperature when you're in the vacuum of space. Story Musgrave, a male astronaut, experienced frostbite on his fingers during a spacewalk. The Gemini astronauts, also men, had problems with overheating. So improper temperature isn't a matter of comfort, but of safety. So just starting off, women are using equipment that puts them at a disadvantage. As a science fiction author, my literal job is to design future worlds. But the imprints of men are so pervasive that it is difficult to know what the future would look like if it were designed with women in mind. In the real world, when things are designed for us, they are often designed by men. Perhaps you've heard the story of Sally Ride and the number of tampons that NASA thought should go into space for a one-week mission? 100. That's, um, for guys, that's a little bit of an overkill. They also designed a makeup kit for women astronauts. Now, to be fair, this is something that a woman requested, but she asked for it because she knew how media represented women who appeared without makeup. While the makeup kit might seem like a trivial point, it underlines how often women are asked to conform to expectations that are decades old. We are asked to be silent about problems, like a suit not fitting, just in order to participate. And every time we do that, we carry those imprints forward into the future. I was talking with Carrie Love, who is a retired spacesuit designer, and she said that while we can look back and understand why women were an afterthought in aerospace to this point, we are at serious risk for that to be reproduced as we move into the commercial spaceflight era. There have been so few of us in space that having two women do a spacewalk is extraordinary. But there have been over 400 spacewalks. Only two all women spacewalks have been scheduled and only one of those has occurred. In 2019, after Anne McLean's first spacewalk, she realized that she needed to use a medium hut. So did Cook. There was only one prepared for spacewalking. Oh, there were two on the station, bec but because the previous year of spacewalks had been only men using the large and extra large suits, the other medium hut wasn't prepped for use. That takes hours of effort, and if you screw up, <laughs> someone could literally die. There were only six people on station at the time, and their time was tightly scheduled. They would have been faced with making a choice between trying to fit prepping the EMU into their cramped schedule, wearing the wrong size, rescheduling vital maintenance work to maintain the current staffing, or restaffing. There were only two women in space, there were four men. The math on the restaffing was simple and clear. So to be clear, the decision to restaff the spacewalk was absolutely correct. The astronauts needed to be safe, but it is a decision built on a long causal chain of sexism reaching back 50 years to the birth of NASA. Why would you need two spacesuits that fit women when it had been a decade since there had been two women on the ISS? And McLean still marked a first on that mission. She became the first woman to serve in two different crews with other women. 
pause for a moment to unpack that. With that one exception in 2010, every other woman who has lived on the ISS served with an otherwise entirely male crew. Last year, we finally had the first all-woman spacewalk because while Jessica Meyer and Christina Cook were the only, uh, excuse me, we finally had the first all-woman spacewalk, but while Jessica Meyer and Christina Cook were the only people outside the space station, they were still outnumbered by the men on the ISS who participate in prepping for the spacewalk. So to be clear, NASA has recognized this systemic problem and has been working towards gender uh, parity. The last three astronaut classes had near or near equal numbers, but there have been decades of all-male crew selections, and it will take years for that balance to shift. Even if NASA does achieve gender parity in the astronaut core, we're unlikely to ever see an all-woman ISS crew because our international partners fly almost exclusively men. When the U.S. was buying a seat on the Soyuz, one of the seats was always a cosmonaut, and there's only one woman in their, in their program. The ESA, of which Germany is a member, has only one woman in their active astronaut corps. That's Samantha Cristoforetti of Italy. Canada also only has one woman in their corps. Germany has a private initiative called the Astronauten. They raised money to train and send a German woman into space. They had 400 applicants. Um, I'm going to mispronounce these names. Uh, Insatil Eich and Susanna Randall have been training since 2018. The plan is to send one of them to the ISS this year. The plan was also set to send one to the ISS in 2021 and 2020 and 2019. ESA Mission Control is here in Germany. The ESA's Astronaut Training Center is in Germany, but somehow a German woman has never been selected for the ESA's Astronaut Corps? Until last year. For the first time, the ESA named reserve astronauts. These are people who will get to go into space or go into the main program if something happens to one of the main astronauts. And in that reserve corps, there are two German women, uh, Amelie Schonenwald and Nicola Winter. Amelie has a PhD in integrative structural biology. She is so smart that I don't even know what her PhD means. She said that when she was little, she wanted to be an astronaut and read everything she could get about space. The older she got, the more unrealistic she thought the goal was. Nicola Winter became the second female German fighter pilot in 2007, and there, I think, you begin to see why there are so few astronaut candidates among German women. There are no role models. And the path to selection is still based on criteria originally dictated by NASA, which were originally based on their criteria that to be an astronaut, you had to be a test pilot. In 1961, in the United States, 13 women went through testing as part of the Women in Space study. These were studies that were designed by Dr. William Lovelace for the Mercury astronauts. He wanted to put women through the same test to see if women would be good candidates for space. The tests ranged from having ice water pumped into their ears to induce vertigo to a sensory deprivation tank. One woman was in the tank for over 10 hours when the researchers finally brought her out because they wanted to go home. <laughs> she had fallen asleep. Across the board, the women who passed that initial round of testing did as well or better than their male counterparts. My favorite of these is a woman who handled the stress testing so well and I think the reason she did is because stress testing is like buzzers going off and lights flashing as you try to answer complicated questions. I think the reason she did so well is because she was the mother of eight. <laughs> and she was just like, what, this is Tuesday? <laughs> but all of these women were pilots who had logged hundreds or thousands of flight hours, often more than the men who were actually selected for the astronaut program. The United States government shut down the women in space study. When you hear about these women today, they are often called the Mercury 13, but they called themselves the FLATS, the first lady astronaut trainees. The story of the FLATS wasn't widely known until fairly recently, 
But among women working in space, their story of trying to reach space and being blocked because of their gender has resonated. As we move forward into the world where commercial space flight offers opportunities to go based not on skills, but the amount of money in one's wallet, it raises questions about who space is for. When the first woman, for, excuse me, when the first German woman goes into space, how will she get there? Who will decide that she deserves to be there? And will she be alone? Space sounds like the future, but it is the present. It is a present that has excluded German women. Think about that little girl who wanted to be an astronaut, but became discouraged. So my question for you is, what stories are you going to tell and share that are going to shape the rest of the 21st century? So, uh, so that's a 15 minute keynote, congratulations. You've survived, um, so have I. Uh, I am now happy to answer questions about literally anything. Um, and the only things that I won't answer are things that are not my story to tell, but I'm happy to talk about women in space. I have a lot more stories um, and things to talk about. I'm happy to talk about science fiction. I'm happy to talk about writing. I'm happy to talk about being a creative person with depression um, in what that's like, or my cat, <laughs> literally anything. Or we can all just go outside. I'm hearing a vote for outside. <laughs> oh wait, there's a question. <laughs> yeah. So I, I would be interested in how you do your research for your science fiction books when it comes to space and like, do you have contacts you can ask all those very specific questions? Thank you. Um, so the the research process for me is um, so my my background, um, as you might be able to tell from the fact that I do hard science fiction, is in puppetry. Um, I was an art major in college. Uh, I do not have an advanced. I actually don't have a degree at all. Um, but the way I handle it is I first do what I call uh, broad research, which is. Uh, often just Wikipedia, where I just kind of get a, a general sense of the era or time or, or that I'm looking at. And that's just enough to, to give me um, the ability to write a kind of a, a synopsis of what I think the story is going to be about, which then allows me to focus my research into things that are plot specific that I feel like I'm going to need to know. Um, and then uh, that gives me an outline, and that outline allows me to do very focused research and identify the subject matter experts that I'm going to need. I tend to write things um, that uh, include a lot of brackets. So I'll say that my manuscript is full of, and then the captain said, jargon, as he jargoned the jargon. Um, or, uh, and then I, I will send it to a subject matter expert. It, it, it's actually, um, I, they've asked me to stop using the word jargon. Um, so I, I will say things like, and then the captain said some command phrase as he fiddled with something on the dashboard thingy. Um, so that they know, and then they are essentially playing uh, fill in the blank for me. Because what I've learned is that when I get into the, the stuff like orbital mechanics, um, the amount of information that I need in order to write one line of dialogue um, is, is essentially an advanced degree, so it's better to just ask somebody. In the last panel, you mentioned that the Star Wars generation is in positions of power now, that mm -hmm. the Harry Potter generation is slowly advancing into positions of power, and in combination with commercial space flight, do you see better chances for women or is the problem going to be that well business interests uh, see not including women as uh, saving business expenses uh, even legitimizing the tech bros to be gatekeepers again uh, and keep women out so it's an that's an interesting question because um, I've, I've been talking to some people who are involved in commercial space flight 
And so one one issue is uh, that the you know the glass ceiling um, prevents women often from making as much money as men. But even when they do, when they are making as much money as men, the perception um, of them spending that money on themselves is entirely different. And so th the they are having trouble attracting women to to spend money that they have that you know. Even, like women who are on a, a comparable economic level to some of their male counterparts because it is seen as more self-indulgent. And so the women are often self-selecting them out because of the societal pressures that are put on them. Uh, okay, thank you. That's looking at the customer side of the business. What about the crews themselves? I mean, even commercial space flight is going to need professional, professional astronauts to etc so um, so it's sh so uh, on the the crew side uh, the um, the spacecraft that are going up now are so automated that um, like the NASA astronauts know how to handle an abort but they're so automated and so complicated that um, it, that that you can go up as uh, what the mercury astronauts called spam in a can um, so you, you don't actually need, uh, need that for crew selection, um, which is, you know, which, which then, we, then gets into a whole different conversation about who, who do you call an astronaut. Um, but yeah, it, it would be, it would be great if crew selection were that. Um, on the other hand, when you get up there and you're doing, uh, doing the science, like just going up and coming back down, I think anybody can do. But when you're getting up there and doing the science, the number of advanced, the, the amount of advanced degrees and training that you have to have to be selected are such that many people have been kept out by gatekeepers before we get to that point. Um, and again, I, I, I talk about, <clears throat> I was ranting with other people about the Artemis program earlier. Um, so we just announced the Artemis astronauts. It's uh, three men, one woman, one woman. Um, uh, or you can look at it another way. It's three white people and one person of color. And they, uh, they announced, you know, that Artemis was going to land the first person of color and the first woman on, on the moon. So when you look at the staffing for that, um, we've partnered with Canada. So one of the astronauts is Canadian, as before mentioned. They have only one woman. So the chances were that it was going to be a guy. Um, the, uh, so that's one, one astronaut. Um, then we have uh, the commander of the mission who was the chief astronaut for NASA and one of the perks of being a chief the chief astronaut is that you then get to name yourself to a plum assignment when you step down. So he named himself as mission commander for Artemis. So now we have two white guys. So that leaves two remaining spots. One goes to Victor Glover who is a black man, and the other is Christina Cook. Everybody on there is qualified. It's like I'm not complaining about the qualifications of anybody, but the numbers game meant that that was, um, it, it seemed likely. On the other hand, there are women of color in the astronaut corps. So why pick one over the other? In your speech, <clears throat> you gave us a lot of um, facts, mm -hmm. but why do you think women have been excluded in the beginning in the 60s and later? Is it we have to protect the little women or women can't do the job or why? <laughs> So um, there, there are a number of, of things. Um, they were legitimately concerned they were legitimately concerned that um, our female parts would wander around. Uh huh. No, they were legitimately concerned that our womb would like, like you, you've heard about the wandering uterus. They, uh, so they were they were legitimately concerned that unknown things would happen. And and I'm like, this is fucking space. Yeah, it's like it's a 15 minute space flight. I, I mean. I don't, I don't know what you think is going to happen in 15 minutes <laughs> for those first space flights. So they were, they were, I say legitimately, 
I say legitimately. That's, I don't think that's a legitimate concern. Um, they, they claim that that was, that was the state, one of the stated concerns. Uh, the other was that um, immediately, after, uh, immediately after World War II, um, there, it, there was the return to normalcy, um, which created this fictional version of what femininity was. Um, and so women were very firmly put back into a box. Um, and a lot of it has to do with who is in charge. So when I say the United States government shut it down, um, it's actually uh, Lyndon Johnson, the president of the United States at the time, um, said, you know, that he, he, he said, shut it down. Um, so it, it has a lot to do with who is in power and, and what their views are. Uh, Dr. Lovelace, you know, it sounds great that he wanted to see how women were, would do. Uh, and there's two reasons that they were interested in it. One was that they were having trouble finding, um, early on, they were having trouble finding uh, male candidates who were small enough um, because they had, they, they had weight problems initially uh, getting, getting the rockets off. So they were like, well, let's look at ladies. They're smaller. Um, but the other thing, once they had gotten past that, because they were running these tests after the Mercury astronauts had been selected, is that he's like, yeah, we, we need to send women in space because eventually we're going to have space stations and we're going to need secretaries. Oh. The fuck he did. Almost like came out of his mouth hole. So, um, so basically, in the short answer to your question is sexism. <laughs> and the patriarchy. <laughs> So you talked about, now you have your pick after having written four books of Lady Astronaut Universe, you have your pick of subject matter experts, but where or how did you start finding them? Did you have connections? Yeah, so how did I start finding subject matter experts? My first introduction was Katie Coleman. Um, and I, uh, it, you know, in the days when Twitter was a different type of garbage fire, um, but I, I put out a, a thing on, on Twitter saying that I wanted to talk to any woman who worked in aerospace because at the time, and it has, thank heavens, shifted, uh, but at the time there were no autobiographies by women astronauts at all. Um, and the few books that were written by women, uh, Sally Ride had a book for kids. Um, there were a lot of books written by women astronauts for kids, because that's what publishers, where publishers put them. Um, so I wanted to talk to someone about sexism, basically. So I'm like, anybody who's working in the aerospace industry, um, ideally a pilot uh, or an astronaut. And my friend Stacy Berg, who's a fantastic science fiction writer, saw it and said, hey, I'm friends with Katie Coleman, um, and also you are coming to Houston on book tour. Do you want to meet her? And I'm like, why did you phrase that as a question? <laughs> um, so, uh, so I met Katie, uh, and uh, she was fantastic um, and was very helpful. And then, uh, and then at the Nebula conference, uh, Chell Lindgren um, was the keynote speaker. And so I met him. And at one point, he asked the question that every author kind of dreads, which is, what are you working on now? Um, because we've ne we haven't figured out how to talk about it in short form yet. <laughs> um, or we're in a place of despair just in general with it. But I, I was like, well, it's, um, I'm working on this Apollo-era science fiction novel, which is uh, Calculating Stars. And he said, Apollo-era science fiction? I would like to read that. And I'm like, well, I would like for you to read that. So, um, so we uh, he he started ex we exchanged emails and um, he started uh, reading it. So basically, everybody was either a personal contact or someone that I ran into at a science fiction convention. But science fiction is the answer, because yes. because they're all fans. Yeah, they're all fans. Um, but uh, NASA actually has a PR department and. Uh, you can, you can write to them. There's no guarantee, but you can write to them and say, hello, I am looking for uh, someone that will t can talk to me about 
um, and they're, they, they have a, a mission of um, public education, and so they, they will very likely at least connect you with someone, and you may eventually, you know, it, it, I, I've had very good success that way also. Yes. Sorry, I did not mean to monopolize you and keep everyone <laughs> from the sun. Just a very quick question. Uh, was there any science fiction in the 1950s, 60s, and I hardly dare admitting it, I'm not an expert, uh, that gave positive role models mm -hmm. besides Uhura in Star Trek that encouraged women or that at least made it possible for the people at NASA to picture women in space, besides being secretaries, of course? Yeah, um, so the interesting thing is that every single uh, like big property, big chain, uh, um, like Buck Rogers, um, the Space Cadets, which had a very different meaning at the time. Um, there were all of these different uh, different things that had um, big followings, and all of them had a hyper intelligent uh, scientist woman who, with like nine boy men that she was looking after. Um, all of them did. And then this woman who was more competent than everybody else on the team was always the one who was put into danger and had to be rescued by the guy. So the role models were there-ish, but not, uh, but, but also carefully in a box. Um, there's this book that I read from the 1930s, uh, Danger Planet. Um, and, you know, again, there's the hyper-competent woman in there, and, uh, and it's set in the future, and, um, and, and I remember this line from it. You would never know from the way that, the, that she was treated uh, by, her, by the other men in the, in the police department uh, that she was anything, um, that, that, she, uh, that, that she was a woman. Like, because they just treated her like one of the guys. Um, it, was, it was just like this, like, what an amazing thing. Look at the future. A woman who's treated the way men are treated? Um, so so they, the, the role models were there, but they were not written by women for women. Um, and that's, that's one of the big, big differences. Um, and... And, and so it, it, it then becomes hard to imagine yourself there. Uh, there was another thing, that, uh, another example that I thought of. You can ask short questions. I don't do short answers, though. So um, One example would be uh, Heinlein's Podcane of Mars. Heinlein's Podcane of Mar Mars, yeah. yeah. And interestingly, actually, Heinlein is an interesting figure because he is, when you read his stuff in... Uh, in the lens of the era in which it was written. He was writing career women who were not married and did not have an interest in being married, like predominantly. Like when you look at Stranger in a Strange Land, uh, you know, it's got, um, but uh, career women, all of them, and none of them were interested in getting married. Eventually, of course, they succumb to Valentine Michael Smith's charms, but I mean, who wouldn't? Um, yeah. There's one right there. Yeah. Um, so in your conversation with, with all these experts, was there anything that surprised you or shocked you or maybe even positively surprised you a lot? Or can yeah. you tell us some more fun stories or something yeah. or shocking stories or anything? Um, so um, one, of the, one of the things that I was uh, surprised by um, was, uh, th so there were, um, so we hear about Amelia Earhart all the time. Um, but she was actually not that big of a deal in a lot of ways. Um, because her first airplane crossing, she was just a passenger. And she got credit for being the first woman to cross the Atlantic in an airplane, but she was just a passenger. And then she was like, you know what? People are making a big deal about this. I'm gonna go get my pilot's license. And she went to the 99s and, uh, well, I guess they weren't the 99s at the time, but they um, went, to, there, there was a, a really strong group of women pilots who were doing things like um, powder puff derbies, which were these uh, 
the, these flights, these races, they were all women races. And the women who were flying these were repairing their own planes. Many of them had designed and built their own planes. Like these were, these women were hardcore pilots. Um, when you start reading, uh, there's a, a book by um, Jean Norma, oh no, Janora, shoot, what's her last name? She was one of the, the Mercury 13, Janora Nesson, um, Jessen, Janora Jessen. She wrote a, a book about uh, the Powder Puff Girls, Powder Puff Derby, and um, like woman after woman in that are, are just like, there's a gender norm, forget that. I'm gonna do this other thing. It's a, it's a fantastic, fantastic book. Um, the other one that I was uh, stunned by was uh, Mary, I'm terrible with names, just in case you can't tell. Um, I can't remember her last name, uh, but she was the first Irish pilot, and uh, she designed and f built and flew her own plane two years after the Wright brothers. Um, and uh, and her dad was like, um, "Hey, could could we maybe not do that? What if I give you a car? <laughs> if I give you a, an automobile, will you stop doing the airplane stuff?" And she's like, how about I drive the car to the airfield? <laughs> so, uh, so there were a lot, like she was, again, just ridiculously, ridiculously competent. Um, what are some of the other fun ones? Um, there's... Uh, this is uh, this is a, a, a mixed fun story. Um, I think it's Rhea Seddon. One of the one of the uh, the first class of women astronauts. Actually, I don't think it was no no. It was um, oh I'm, I'm so bad at names. One of the first class of women astronauts um, had very long hair, and uh, when uh, when she went up, um, she she always she wore in a ponytail to to restrain it, but there was a point where um, it got caught in a camera and like pulled in, and uh, and they they extracted it. But she's like, you do not report this to to the male astronauts. Like, do not report this. And they're like, why don't you put it in a bun or something? And she said, because I want little girls to see my long hair and know that I'm a woman in space. And, and I'm just like, that's, you know, one, that's really beautiful. And two, how upsetting is it that she had to wear her hair in a way that endangered her in order to make that point? Um, oh, here's a fun story to end on, though. Uh, Katie Coleman um, was at this, uh, at an event, and they had, you know, those big cutouts of astronauts and her son was with her and he's like, mommy, is that you? And she said, no, sweetie, I, I, I'm not sure. It's not me, but I'm, and, and he said, well, whose mommy is it? <laughs> because for him, the normal was astronauts were mommies. suddenly realized if I did this, I could see you. <laughs> You're obviously very interested in space and women astronauts, and, and I really like your books about <laughs> the lady astronaut, but I also like your Ghost Talkers book, uh, which is surprising because I really prefer science fiction to fantasy. Uh, in the future, are you going to keep on writing science fiction or are there any fantasy projects? Um, well, so first of all, thank you for liking Ghost Talkers. Um, I also like Ghost Talkers, but uh, there were problems. Um, I, I would love to. It, it honestly depends on, on what the publisher is interested in buying. Um, so just to, for 
uh, as a kind of reality check for those of you who are writers, um, and also for those of you who are readers so that you know your power. Um, uh, Ghost Talkers, uh, when it came out, it did not do terribly well. And part of that was because my, um, the publicist that I had at Tor, that publicist, uh, forgot that the book was coming out. Um, so it was scheduled to come out in August, uh, and then they didn't actually send me on tour until uh, November, um, and uh, it was election day of 2016, which was not a good day in the U.S. Um, and, and strangely, no one was buying books. Um, it was really weird. Um, so, so the book didn't do terribly well, uh, and they were getting ready to drop me. Um, they had already bought Calculating Stars, and when we were at a point where I was like, okay, in the next project, and they weren't talking to me about what the next project would be. Um, because Ghost Talkers hadn't done well, um, and and when they eventually like Calculating Stars took off, and my uh, my editor at the time was like, when can we have the next Lady Astronaut book? And I'm like, well, you could have already had it. <laughs> um, but what she told my agent was that I, that Mary Robinette just kept sending us fantasy titles, and we just they just don't do as well for her. Um, and, and it was not true, actually. I had sent them a, do a document that was three pages long of books that I want to write, the first page and a half of which was science fiction. Um, but for whatever reason, my science fiction uh, sells better for the publisher. So while I love fantasy and I have a completed novel that is um, uh, noir with dragons, um, uh, there's, uh, we, we are, we're sitting on it because like I, I have that, I have a, an urban fantasy, um, giant battles and fairy completed. We're not going to try to sell it. Um, uh, that is in the Patreon. If you s flip back, um, I published the entire thing for my Patreon. Um, it's called good housekeeping. And, uh, if you look in the tags, you can get to it. Uh, at any level of my Patreon, by the way. Um, so, yes, I would love to do more fantasy. Um, and the market will shift, uh, and I'll come back around to it. But right now, uh, science fiction appears to be where I am. And I, like, I love both of them, like, to be clear. So, um, so there. There are two short stories, by the way, with uh, Ginger Stuyvesant, the main character of uh, Ghost Talkers, that are on my website for free. Mm -hmm. yeah. I've seen you have write a new book, The Spare Man. Mm -hmm. Can you tell me anything about it? Yes, um, so The Spare Man is a murder mystery set on an interplanetary cruise ship. Uh, it's a happily married... Thank you. <laughs> um, uh, and uh, it's a happily married couple and their small dog solving crime. Um, uh, if anyone, and th like, uh, you probably have not seen um, these movies called the Thin Man movies, but um, I highly recommend them. They're from the 1930s, and it's basically the thin man in space. It was a happily married couple and their small dog solving crime immediately post-prohibition. So it's, it's a straight-up murder mystery. It's a, a comedy mystery. Okay, uh, me again, I'm sorry. Hello. But I think it's a question all of us have been asking ourselves. What's the name of your cat, and in which ways does it inspire you? <laughs> thank you. Yes, thank you. It's Elsie. Um, I see Elsie does have some fans. Um, uh, so my cat, Elsie, um, inspires perhaps the wrong word for Elsie. And, um, uh, Elsie's a small calico. Um, and uh, one of the things that is interesting about her is that um, she uses buttons to talk. So uh, there's something called uh, augmentati uh, augmentative interspecies communication. 
which was created in 2019 by a speech and language therapist named Christina Hunger, who was like, what happens if I use the same techniques that I use for my nonverbal patients with my new puppy? Uh, and the answer is that her dog now has an 80 word vocabulary and has spawned an international, uh, uh, like a global movement with people doing this. Uh, Elsie and I are enrolled in a study um, out of uh, UC Davis, or no, UC University of, uh, sorry, San Diego, um, with uh, 2,000 animals enrolled. Um, and basically each button has a word recorded on it. Uh, you model the, the words for the, the animal and then uh, and then they, they press them. So Elsie has 94 words. Um, how does she inspire me? Um, she, uh, she's been, we've been doing this for um, a little over, oh, oh, this, we're coming up on two years now. Um, uh, and it, it f you know, it, I have a communication every day with a non-human intelligence which is fundamentally going to change the way I write science fiction because she, we, we have um, the, the, she doesn't speak English, to be clear. She uses the buttons to communicate and the buttons are recorded in English, but, and we have an overlapping understanding of the buttons, but there are also things where I can tell that she clearly has a different understanding of what that button does, means, or, or um, has attached a different meaning, but there's enough of an overlap that we can, we can agree on it. So as an example, um, this was fairly early on. She, uh, you know how cats like it when, like chasing reflections? So, um, so my phone was reflecting and uh, she, she jumps up on the back of a chair and like tries to get at it and jumps down and presses want and then jumps back on the chair and tries to get at it and jumps back down and says laser bird. And she has laser because of laser pointers, not because she's an overlord. Um, and I'm like, yeah, what else would you call it with the words that you have? But I don't know why she called it a laser bird. Did she pick a laser because that it was bright like a laser? Did she pick that word because it moves quickly? Bird because it was on the ceiling? Bird because it was fluttering? Like why, what does that word actually mean to her? I don't know. And so when we have conversations, I'm looking at her body language, I'm looking at context, and I'm also looking at a pattern of how she has used the word in the past. Um, she has made up curses. Um, litter box is one of them. Uh, and there's a strong pattern of other learners using whatever their word for potty or poop is as a curse. Um, if she does not like someone, she will look at them and call them dog. <laughs> um, or stranger. Um, but I, I started doing, like I was a skeptic when I saw it first. Um, and then when I started doing it, I was hoping that she could just tell me what she wanted to play. But we're having, we, uh, we just had to have our other cat put down in February and we've had conversations about grief that I would like, things that are fundamentally more complicated than I would have ever imagined. I had read that cats have the average, the intelligence of an average three to four year old. Um, and it is like dealing with a fur toddler. Also with the random conversation changes that they do. Um, but yeah, yeah, it's been, it's been fascinating. So, uh, and, and the other way that she inspires me is that she tells me to go to bed when I stay up too late. Um, and uh, when I am on Zoom calls, she will often sit there and go, all done, all done. <laughs> Loud, stranger, all done. Which helps. <laughs> like, sorry, I have to go, my cat. <laughs> you can see her, there's videos of her on Instagram if you want to watch them. Okay. Daylight yet? I have one. Okay. Um, in the, uh, in the afterword of the Lady Ast of the, uh, the first Lady Astronaut, mm -hmm. you're talking about the hidden figures, Lady. Mm -hmm. um, so my question goes to, what about the female 
participants in the space program that do not go up? That's a great question. So um, when I was started writing uh, the Lady Astronaut books, the film um, and book Hidden Figures had not yet come out. Uh, so I was reading other things, Rise of the Rocket Girls, um, and, and other things. I was like really having to struggle to find stuff. But it was clear that women had been in the space program from the very beginning. Uh, Jet Propulsion Laboratory had a policy that they did not hire men for their computer department because they didn't like their work ethic. Um, sorry, guys. <laughs> um, and and it was it was very clear that they had this this fundamental role in in figuring out how we got into space, but um, they are left out of history books. Like when you actually look at photos from the time, there are women and people of color all through the space program. But when you look at modern textbooks and modern retellings of them, they aren't there. So. Um, so for me, I think that the, like, the astronaut is the person who gets all the credit and they're supported by this huge number of people. Uh, but it, it's also about where the people are allowed to have their voices because while the computer department was all women, um, a woman that, that's also partly because, uh, a woman and a man who apply with comparable degrees, the man gets put into engineering, which pays more and has more prestige, the woman goes into computing. So, um, so the women were there, but the decision makers were still dudes. Okay, sunshine? Oh, no. <laughs> Um, so what I experienced on the convention is that always when we talk about female leads, people will say there's a strong female lead in the book, in the mm -hmm. movie or whatever. But if we talk about male, oh, there's nothing, it ha doesn't have to be anything in front of it. It's just no. a yeah. male lead. So what's your thoughts on that? <laughs> I have a lot of thoughts on that. <clears throat> yeah. So, you know... I think it's important to understand that a man can be anything he wants to be. Um, some of my best friends are men. I'm, <laughs> I'm, I'm married to a man. Um, my house husband, he, he works very hard to keep the house clean for me. I'm able to come here because he's at home taking care of things, which I really appreciate. And you know, it's, it's, so, it's so important to provide role models for these young men who, who think that really they can only be this very narrow selection of things. They think they can really only be a warrior. They think that they can really only be a spy or a astronaut or a doctor or a lawyer or a judge. And it's so sad, really. It's so sad when they could be so much more. So one of the reasons that I think that we say strong female protagonist is to give the young men something to look up to because where else are they going to look for strength, really? Um, can I comment on that? Yes. <laughs> So there is a, um, a German, I am not sure if she's really a feminist, Heidi Kabel, she is, is a famous um, actor, and she said, I tried to translate it, so we only have real gender opportunity when there's also weak females in leading positions, so yeah. this is it, right? It's yeah. vice versa. Yeah, and, and the, um, like one of the, the things that so, so when people were first saying um, strong female character, what they actually meant was a well-defined female character because the women characters were often um, poorly defined uh, in, in, early, in, in a lot of early science fiction because it was written by men for men. And apparently none of them actually met a woman. Um, but 
the the other piece of that is that when women were writing science fiction, Ursula Le Guin talks about this, that when she wrote Wizard of Earthsea, she was like, I'm gonna be so subversive. I'm gonna have a story about where a wizard gets his power. Like every story about wizards are about old wizened men. And so my wizard is gonna be young, um, he's gonna be brown, and he's gonna come from an archipelago. And it wasn't until after the book was out that she realized that she had named only one of the female characters. Only one of the women characters had, had actual lines of dialogue. Everybody else was reported. And what she said was that she realized that because she had grown up reading science fiction written by men for men, that even though she thought of herself as a feminist, she still wrote science fiction for men. And I think the only, I think that the, the way that we change it is not just, you know, having, having women in there of, of all different abilities, but writing fiction by women for women. And it, it's, it's not, it, it's a lot of it is us reprogramming our own minds and, and deprogramming the, the stereotypes. Like when I, um, when my Glamorous Histories came out, it's Jane Austen with magic. I heard myself say to a guy, oh, but you may not like it, so it's really girly. And I'm like, what just came out of my mouth? Like, why can't men enjoy a romance? So I think, it's, I think there's a lot of deprogramming that needs to happen. Um, I guess you might have read, and I don't, don't know if anyone else has read, um, a Hugo winner from a few years ago, The Man Who Bridged the Mist by Kit Johnson. Uh, it won in yeah. the category long, uh, sh um, short novel, I Novella. think. Yeah. yeah. And it was written with every other character being a man and a woman. Uh, I read some interview with Kit Johnson, I think. And that, was, I think, was a, an interesting experiment because when, when she uh, did alterations to the story, she had to change the gender of every character because every other character was to be a man and then a woman mm -hmm. and then a man and then a woman. And I think that is a really interesting way of trying to, because she didn't change their role in the story or their characters, she just, changed their gender yeah. and that that was a, an interesting way of trying to get away from your thoughts about men and women mm -hmm. yeah oh. I, I've done that as well not that you know that prescribed but um, uh, in the spare man uh, there are a couple of characters where I, I fl switched their gender and I did not switch any of their uh, their actions or personalities um, and I think that you can do that with stuff in the future, uh, stuff that is set modern day. Um, it becomes a little more complicated because you also have to deal with the way other people react to them, which does shift. Uh, and I think that you can do it and just say, you know what, everybody deal with it. But it, it's, it's slightly more complicated. Um, but yeah, I, I agree. I, I was uh, just at a writing workshop and, um, one of the critiquers, who was a woman, said to another woman, you know, I noticed that you have very few men in this, in this story. It's mostly women. Um, and I'm, I'm wondering what you, you know, if, if, that, if that seems okay. And it was like, so this other story that we just read that had an all-male cast you didn't comment on. And it's because she had so internalized that sexism that she saw it in one place but not in the other. And that's, yeah, that's hard. It's hard. Okay, we are officially out of time so we can go into the sunlight. Uh, oh, no, wait, you I have, have one. A, you have, you I have, have one. one more. Okay. Um, does the setting of the spare man have anything to do with your writing workshops? 
Does the setting of the spare man have anything to do with the writing workshops? A hundred percent, yes. Um, yeah, I kept being on these cruise ships. I'm like, you could murder someone on this. Um, and then I was like, I should write a murder mystery on this. I should do the thin man. I should do the thin man in space. Um, and so I started imagining what one of these cruise ships would look like and what the economic disparities would be on the cruise ships. I got to talk to the uh, head chef on one of the ships um, and we spent 45 minutes talking about how to murder someone. <laughs> it was one of the best days of my life. <laughs> Yeah. So yes, I find I find stories everywhere. <laughs> All right. So let's flee into the light. Thank um, you very much. Thank you.